Um, so thanks for joining us for a scaling discussion. Um, scaling is uh, super top of mind right now in, in blockchains in general, and especially Ethereum. Um, the question really is how can, you, how can you scale this technology in a way that doesn't involve too much centralization? Uh, it's easy to have maybe 21 nodes or something like that and uh, have faster transaction throughput. That's sort of the naive way to do it and maybe for some use cases it's effective. Of course in Ethereum we want to be maximally decentralized. Decentralized is possible, um, so how to go about that? Uh, there's a few approaches. Um, and we're going to get into one uh, very promising approach which relies on zero knowledge proofs. Um, so w one thing to keep in mind for um, anybody developing a DAP is it's super crucial to get a sense of how you might scale your, your technology, your, your, your DAP. Uh, we made the mistake, or I, I hesitate to call it a mistake, it was a very cool application, but we had a scale fail at Shapeshift. Uh, who, who heard of uh, PRISM or played around with PRISM? It was uh, pretty much all on chain, a way to, to uh, manage your assets in a decentralized fashion. And it was cutting edge, super cool. People res responded well to it. Um, what it lacked is the ability to scale effectively. So uh, when the, the big bull market hit in 2017 and the gas prices went through the roof, we, you know, you always hear about crypto kitties. Uh, at Shapeshift with Prism, we encountered a lot of the same challenges in terms of paying very high fees to maintain our Oracle. Um, it was expensive for users to um, rebalance their portfolios, uh, and it kind of was just a general clusterfuck. So the idea now, with you know, kind of across the ecosystem, is if you have a great decentralized application idea, cool, but make sure or start to factor in right now how it's going to scale effectively. Um, so the, the way this really is, is going to work um, potentially is through different layer two solutions until layer one hits with uh, sharding and uh, some of the other things you've probably heard about. You've heard a lot about Plasma. That was a big thing at DEF CON. Uh, today's talk is going to be on zero knowledge proofs, which is a, a different layer two solution. And there's two flavors uh, that we're going to talk about. So uh, Alex from the Ethereum Foundation is going to start off and talk about scaling using ZK Snarks. Hi everyone. Uh, yes, um, I've been working on Rollup. Uh, this is the project we call this this kind of iteration of Plasma, but we don't call it Plasma because Plasma people don't like it. Um, it's a, an idea of a side chain which is driven by zero knowledge or specifically by Snarks. Uh, the other approach is Starks, and Ken is going to talk more about it. So how many of you are familiar with zero knowledge proofs in general? Uh, that's good. And how, how, how many of you like, really know what you can do with it? What, what can be built with zero knowledge? How exactly they work? OK, much less people. So uh, I'm going to dive a little deeper in the technology and, and take you step by step through how you actually do, use zero knowledge and how we do it for, uh, for, for, for scaling. So zero knowledge uh, is, in general, a cryptographic protocol which allows you to prove that some computational statement is true without revealing any information about the statement and, and, and the input parameters of the statement other than that this, the, that what uh, the verifier already knows. Um, so it takes, so more specifically, we have one function which is publicly known. Everybody agrees. Everybody knows what the function represents. Uh, we call this function circuit because it's, it's very similar to how hardware circuits are built. Uh, we have some public output, some public parameters, which everybody also knows, uh, which can be different from verification to verification. And then we have some hidden parameters, uh, some private input, which we call witness, uh, which we're not going to disclose to anybody, but we're going to prove that we have, we know some witness such that if we evaluate this function on this witness, we're going to get the public parameters. Um, and the great part about zero knowledge proofs such as SNARKs and Stark specifically is the S part. So ZK SNARKs stand for zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive arguments of knowledge. Um, zero knowledge means that we don't disclose information about the private input. Succinct means that the verification part is much, much lower than the prover. So the verifier must do much less work. And this is what we use for scaling. 
Um, Non-interactive means that there, there, there is not supposed to be any interaction between the approver and the verifier. In some protocols, you need kind of some kind of interaction. For example, the, 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 the verifier will send some public randomness to the prover, and then the prover will respond. But we have a trick called Fiat Shamir heuristics, which allows us to just, the prover just posts some data on chain, and anybody can read this data and, and be sure that the statement is correct. An argument of knowledge is uh, basically like the ability to convince you that I know the secret input such that this, this, this function, the circuit, evaluates together with the public parameters to truth. So, how it, so what's, what's great about SNARKs specifically is that the verification cost is super, super cheap. Like the prover cost is uh, O of N, which, which is like, you cannot go below that. You have to execute each transaction at least once. To, to go through like each, not transaction, like in, in, in our case it's transactions, but essentially like any part of the circuit of this big public function, you cannot go below n, like where n is the number of steps in the circuit. However, the verifier always does the same amount of work, which is constant, no matter how many steps are in, in circuit. And the, the com communication complexity, which is the amount of data which we put on chain, is also constant. And it's, it, it's, it's extremely low. In, in, in case of SNARKs, we only need 288 bytes to be posted on chain to convince you about the statement. Think about it, 288 bytes. It's like not kilobytes, not megabytes. Just, it's, I mean, it's, it's literally nothing. Um, so how, how it works exactly for scaling? Um, we have a main chain, which is a sequence of blocks. And these blocks have limited capacity. We can only fit so much in each block in terms of data or computation. In, in Ether, we measure it with gas. Now, we can introduce a side chain, uh, what we do for Plasma and for, for any other types of side chains. And the idea is that the side chain is completely off chain, so we can scale. However, the security of the side chain is guaranteed by the main chain. So for each block on the side chain, we make a cryptographic commitment. And we send a short uh, cryptographic thing on, on the main chain. Normally, it's uh, Merkle root hash of, uh, of the side chain. Uh, and then once it's committed on the main chain and included in the block, nobody can change it. So and the side chain can, can only go further. And um, we can have a smart contract on the main chain, which governs the, the commitments. And then if something goes wrong, in, in case of Plasma, if an operator of sidechain tries to commit a new block, which is invalid, uh, users have some period of time where they can object. And uh, the smart contract will, we can provide proof of fraud and say, hey, this was the previous state. This is the new state. However, the new state includes something, maybe some transaction, which I did not sign on my behalf from my account. Somebody's trying to steal my money. Please revert it. Uh, which requires everybody to be online constantly and verify the chain, which, which, which is a severe limitation of scalability and also of security because it's not possible for everybody to be constantly online and you might have uh, con conjunctions uh, on, on the main chain. So like your, your transaction of objection can be censored and, and so you can lose money. So like security is not so cool. Um, in the side chain, we can have uh, some state Right, so let, let's assume we have an account-based model like in Ethereum. So you have some accounts. Each account represents uh, a user with a private, with private public key pair and some balance. And we aggregate it in a Merkle tree uh, represented by Merkle root. So when we now have this Merkle root and we commit it on chain. So what we can do with snarks is that we can prove that the new state, the new Merkle root which you commit in the new block is a result of some function which takes the old root, the full state, and the set of transactions as, in, as parameters, and the result is the new root. So we can essentially prove with zero knowledge that the new block is correct, that all transactions included in the new block are valid, that they have been signed correctly by, by people who own their, their funds, and that nobody spends more than they own, and that nobody makes double spends. And this proof, uh, the snark proof, is verified by the Ethereum smart contract. So users don't have to, to, to be online and to, to check and, and make any objections. 
the operator cannot simply commit any incorrect block in the, in, in the, on the main chain. Um, so how it works exactly, for each new block, we create a snark circuit, which is like a large function, which we evaluate. Uh, and in this function, we just have like n transactions, which is a fixed number. And for each transaction, we go and check that the signature is correct and belongs to, to the person who owns the account, that we have a Merkle path from, from this account to the root, uh, and this root belongs to the previous root, which we had, um, that we update the account correctly, that the, the, we, we only take the amount which was signed by, by the user and detract it from, from the, his balance and add it and to the balance of the uh, recipient. And then we check that the new state is correct, like the, the, uh, the root hash has been updated correctly. Um, and the, the verification is extremely cheap and fast and takes like literally just like half a million guests at the moment on, on Ethereum chain for like huge number for 1600 of tr transactions uh, for in, 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 in the prototype which we currently have online on, uh, on the test net. However, the prover takes some time. It takes, it depends on the hardware which we use. So if we have a huge machine with many dozens of processors, we can do it in maybe one minute. Uh, on, a, on my laptop, it, it takes 20 minutes for this large block, um, which, you, which also can be done. So, but how do we achieve throughput? Like each block costs very little and includes many transactions, but it has to be verified on Ethereum. And if we have to wait 20 minutes for the next block, we won't be able to, to, to have high throughput, right? Because e, like this, this 20 minute delay will create inefficiency. So what we do in, in the rollup right now is that we run the transactions, uh, we, we run the commitments in parallel. So we have two parallel pipelines. We have commitments for each block where we just provide the data, which is gonna be included in the next block. And then five, 10, 20 minutes later, we follow with the verification. Uh, and if verification doesn't follow, we can always revert. So the finality has this delay, but users can request from operators all the data, can verify the data themselves, and, and be sure already from the moment of commitment that the data is safe. So like, I, I can go, if, if it's not clear, I can answer the questions about this. Um, so the, 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 the big challenge we have with rollup is, or with this approach in general, is data availability. If data availability was not a problem, we would be able to scale it almost indefinitely. However, if somebody commits a block, and this block is completely correct, and it's represented by new root hash, but nobody knows the underlying data. Like, I changed something in one of the accounts by a correct transaction, uh, but I don't tell anybody what exactly I changed. Then nobody can work with this sidechain anymore. Like nobody can prove anything that new. Like if we have multiple operators which work in sequence, they cannot continue operation. Um, so we need everybody to know exactly what happened for each transaction. Uh, and this is a hard problem to solve. Plasma has some ways to solve it. Like if there are some edge cases. It's, it's non-trivial. Like this has been the biggest problem in Plasma research over the past year. So we solve it by submitting transaction data for each transaction on chain in Ethereum. But we only use TX data. So we don't use storage, we don't do any computations. We only use like nine bytes of data, which is 400 guess per transaction, just to make sure that everybody gets this because we rely on Ethereum for like as a um, broadcast layer. Uh, and um, this, yeah, this is, the, this is what we put in, on, on, on in this on-chain data. And this limits us because we have guess limit for each block, so we can only, like, the current version can only support like up to 500 transactions per second. This is a hard limit because of this data and availability part. But efforts are on the way uh, to solve data availability differently. And if you have any ideas, please come talk to me after the, the, uh, the presentation. Uh, happy to, to discuss it in more detail. Uh, but now like we, we can do 500 transactions per second, which is awesome because this is already much more than Ethereum can handle. And the logic of each transaction can be also like more complex than just simple token transfer. It can be atomic swaps. It can be uh, some complex logic with uh, like sharing, like maybe multi-sig, and so on and so on. So like we can extend it significantly. Um, so the only real big challenge for snarks 
And the only big, in my opinion, but maybe Kent will disagree, we'll, we'll, we'll see, uh, disadvantage of snarks against Starks is the trusted setup part. The trusted setup is what we call a common reference string. We need to create some public randomness, and then people who create this randomness, like person or, or multiple participants, need to forget it and just provide the result of the computation in order for the scheme to be secure. Um, so normally it's used in, like, obviously you cannot trust one person because there is no way to prove that the, the, this, what we call toxic waste, this initial entropy randomness is deleted. Uh, so instead uh, we rely on something like multi-party computation, just like what Zcash did with Sapling and with, with, uh, with uh, Sprout, the previous version, um, where you have many participants uh, such that if at least one of them is honest, the entire scheme is solid and sound. So like it, it, it's only possible to mess up if every, of, every one of the participants agree to collude and all of them retain the data and then they can reconstruct and make fraud proofs. Um, and the problem was with, uh, up to until now with SNARKs that the trusted setup had to be done for each individual circuit. And this limited severely the, the application domain of SNARKs. So like, you could use it for certain applications where you just have two parties or maybe multiple, like a few parties where all of them can participate, but not really for public applications because you don't know those people and it's difficult for, you know, like to establish this trust. And it's very difficult organizationally just to get everybody together and participate on, on every circuit, on every update, on every new application. Um, however, luckily, we have since two weeks a new construct proposed by Sean Bow from Zcash, uh, which offers like um, universal common reference string or trusted setup. A trusted setup still has to be done, but we just need to do it once with many trusted, like m many reputable participants, and it's going to work for all for all applications, for all circuits. You can do any time an update. Uh, you just rely on this. So imagine like if you have high profile people hundreds of them participating, the probability that all of them colluded together like, is, is close to zero. So like, I, I would totally trust all my fortune on, on, on such a sidechain. Um, and yeah, we, we're in Metering already working on implementation. Just check it out, stay tuned. Um, um, you can follow us on Twitter. So now it's interesting to compare it to Starks, Kent. Cool, thank you, Alex. Uh, it just occurs to me that Sonic would be a better fit perhaps for ring signatures. Sorry, awful joke. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so just to preface all this with a few general comments. Um, one of the things that makes the, the zero knowledge proof family of scaling really interesting, I think, is the fact that it relies on cryptography and mathematics rather than game theory. Uh, th this presents some interesting sort of different trade-offs, but I think advantages when it comes to scaling scenarios. Um, namely, uh, and some of the stuff that Alex alluded to in terms of uh, what makes Plasma difficult, uh, you know, the idea of having to have exit games, um, I need to be able to challenge and exit. Uh, it, so it, what that means for the user is potentially you might have to wait like five or seven days to withdraw your funds. There's workarounds on this and people are jamming on Plasma. There's a lot of different flavors of it and it's pretty cool. And it's promising, but th this is a way to sort of circumvent some of those issues. Because if, if you believe the math, and this stuff is very cryptographically sound, it appears, then um, you're in much better position to uh, have scalable technology. So a lot of what Alex already said uh, applies to, to Starks as well. Uh, Starks and Starks are very similar. The, the fundamental idea of, of scaling transactions using... Uh, you know, rolling up transactions and batching them, it still applies, but you're going about it differently. Uh, so as they would say in Thailand, same, same, but different. Um, so let, let's look at some of the, the notable differences. Um, Alex mentioned the most important difference, I think, which is there's no trusted setup. And in, uh, in this world where maximal trustlessness is super important, uh, I don't think this could be understated. Um, you know, people, e even the, the paranoid conspiracy dudes out there on Twitter, you know, sometimes say, well, Zcash, you know, you never know. Maybe the NSA has, you know, the key or somebody is going to bring it all down. Um, on a more pragmatic level, um, I think what this means is various projects can spin up a, a ZK Stark instance 
without requiring a, a big setup sort of ceremony. And th this makes it a lot more uh, potentially adaptable to different, different dApps. Um, you don't really need a critical mass of people to, to do a, a trusted set, set up ceremony. Um, it's more frictionless to implement. Um, another key point, um, and Alex might have some di differences on this as well, uh, proving time generally seems to be faster with Starks. Um, th this has advantages in terms of throughput. Uh, one important disadvantage relative to Snarks is the proof size is like two, two orders of magnitude bigger. So this means when you're posting stuff to chain, it's really not, um, it's going to take up more space and it creates some, some friction there. So is, is it a blocker? I wouldn't say that, but it's definitely a trade-off to keep in mind. Um, uh, on the plus side, Starks are quantum resistant. Uh, so that's good to keep in mind. Although, as Alex pointed out the other day, if quantum uh, computers come out, then you know we have bigger problems than than just layer two solutions. We're going to have to port all blockchains over to, to uh, quantum resistant chains. Um, one interesting thing to keep in mind uh, is most of the development in terms of Starks right now is being done by one organization. They're based in Israel, and they're called Starkware. Uh, one of the founders of Starkware is Eli Ben Sasson, who is also a founder of uh, Zcash. So he's, he's very well steeped in the zero knowledge space. Um, Starks are a relatively new type of uh, scaling solution, but they're built on older cryptography. It's, it's, it's pretty well proven out mathematically. Um, and one of the things that will be interesting to see in the near future is will other groups sort of start jamming on and innovating on Starks, um, or will it just be under the, sort of the purview of one group? Right now, it's just pretty much Starkware. Um, just a few slides here. And um, these did come from Starkware, so perhaps they're a little bit um, biased, but these guys seem very, um, they, they have a lot of good data behind their, their uh, charts. Anyway, uh, this kind of shows some of the comparisons with, with proving time. Uh, an interesting question that I think is sort of uh, un- uh, you know, not quite defined yet, uh, is t to what extent the small differences in proving time matter for the, for the end user and for the, the DAP? Um, this remains to be seen. We'll have to actually build functional technology before we can really get a better understanding of these, uh, these trade-offs. Uh, verifying time is very fast with uh, Starks. Um, so, the verification happens in a, and we'll get into this shortly, but it happens in a smart contract. So the verification happens on chain. It's a way of just saying that yes, in fact, this proof is valid. Um, and there's different ways to go about it, but um, this is sort of one, uh, one advantage as well of the, the Stark approach. Um, okay, so, so in a nutshell, here's how it works. Uh, you, you use what's called Stark Prover nodes, and th these are actually off-chain hardware, like a, you know, maybe a, even a single-core computer or a multi-core computer. Um, right now, it looks like you know, Starks in their early days might be running these themselves. So that begs the question, if, if Starkware or some private company is running these nodes, um, is it still trustless? And in fact, the answer is yes. Because uh, if they try, if anybody, any of these prover nodes running Stark hardware tried to mess with the data, this would be th this would be detectable. So the nature of this uh, technology is such that even you know a small change to the data would uh, would make it obvious that it's been changed. It would render the proof moot. So it, you can still be trustless uh, even when you have this off-chain node uh, or proving hardware run by somebody else. Um, so this, this is doing the proof. Uh, an on-chain smart contract verifies the proof. And wh what this really means in, in um, sort of simpler terms is uh, we don't need to have an on-chain signature for confirmation and storage. This is to offloading a lot of computation, a lot of gas spending that would otherwise be occurring on-chain and taking that off-chain. And that is where the scaling comes from, sort of what uh, Alex was discussing earlier. Um, so. Uh, tentatively, it sort of looks like th this could lead to a 10 to 20x scaling improvement if you take this, uh, take these things off chain. Um, and the uh, again, the, the the approach is is pretty similar to what uh, rollups and snarks would entail. Is uh, imagine you're a DEX and you have a lot of transactions happening off chain. 
you could post all these to chain and have them verified. Everybody is happy and it's trustless, but of course that doesn't scale at all because when gas prices go up, you're spending a lot. You have to pass that on to your, your users or eat that cost yourself. It's not very elegant and scalable. In th this way, you could have 500 transactions and these all are batched in one, one nice little proof and then the proof is posted to chain in such a way that everybody can verify that the transactions happened, everything is cool, above board, but your, your, a lot of the data and a lot of the gas computational spending is, is never um, hitting chain. Um, data size and gas cost scale in a sublinear fashion. Um, so kind of a, a way to visual, visualize that is, let's say to, to take one transaction and post that to the chain cost X gas um, using, uh, using Starks. Uh, you could take 500 transactions and, and batch those up and it would only take 3x the gas. So there you can kind of see the, the scaling potential um, of batching these and, and it's a potentially a dramatic improvement. So a, as with any scaling solution, uh, you know, there's no ma magical fairy dust we can sprinkle on things. There's always trade-offs. Um, so it is a red, relatively larger proof size. Again, a few orders of magnitude larger than SNARKs. Um, this could present some challenges. I, I think it's a little too early to say exactly, you know, what um, that might look like, but uh, it could limit the scaling potential. Um, again, th this, is, this is bleeding edge stuff. It's untested in real life applications. We're very early on in the game. Um, it, it looks promising, but things need to really be proven out in, in real life. Um, for optimal results, we need stark friendly ha hash functions and pre-compiles. Um, so one of the interesting things about both of these technologies is the, the EVM is not ready for, um, it, it could implement these yet, but it is not optimized for, uh, for SNARKs and Starks. Um, in the case of Starks, uh, ideally we would have Stark friendly hash functions and pre-compiles. So we'd have to modify the EVM with the uh, EIP and one of the, uh, one of the forks coming up. Um, it's still possible even without these, but it, it won't be optimized uh, unless and in, until that happens. Um, finally, you know, one of the ideas is like, uh, or one of the challenges is ultimately you have to, you have to post these batched transaction proofs to the chain. And uh, if things get really maxed out again and blocks are always full, well, how, how, can, you, how can you post a proof uh, to the chain when things are full. So then you introduce a, a situation where maybe you're just paying a lot to get that proof onto the chain, um, which is maybe an okay trade-off, but it sort of eats away at the savings a little bit. Um, so again, it's not like this is a magical, uh, it's not like this obviates the need for layer one solutions like, you know, proof is, or uh, sharding and, and sort of creating the uh, Ethereum 2.0 thing. It's, it's complementary to that and perhaps maybe building a bridge to when, th when that's available in a few years. So um, kind of a, you know, a few questions from what, what, this, what, what, what might this look like from the end user's perspective and the DAP developer's perspective? Um, how long does it take transactions to effectively settle? Um, it's likely that five to seven days is way too much. That's the plasma paradigm. They're, they're probably bringing that down, but you know, we're, we're, we want instant gratification in this, um, in this world, ideally. Um, Maybe we can get down to 20 minutes. Is that, is that okay? For a lot of use cases, it probably is. For some, maybe it's not. Um, the, the marketing of Starks, this is very novel technology. How can we, how can we uh, convince users of it that it, it is truly trustless and it's safe and secure? Um, you know, this is, this is new stuff. Uh, we're all collectively just getting our heads, or heads around it. You know, for the end user, how, how do you convey that these crazy zero knowledge proofs with this hardware over here make, makes it safe? That's maybe a challenging for the marketing people out there. Um, also, uh, how much will transaction fees actually decrease? If it's a substantial decline, maybe dApps will choose to pay their fees uh, themselves in order to encourage adoption. So in other words, this could be a really cool onboarding scenario, uh, maybe leveraging meta transactions uh, where, you know, it, right now there's a lot of friction that comes with using a dApp for the first time. Maybe, maybe like a DEX or a whatever given DAP might actually just decide to subsidize these costs because they're paying a lot less for uh, taking transactions on, on chain. So th there's some uh, potential UX and onboarding improvements there as well. Um, 
This also applies to, I would say, roll-ups and, and uh, snarks as well. So um, how do you keep tabs on this? I, again, this is, this is a pretty novel type of scaling technology um, built on some well-known crypto, crypt, uh, cryptographic fundamentals and primitives. Um, but uh, things to watch are, uh, I would just keep an eye on what, what Starkware is doing. Again, they're kind of pushing things forward. See the updates, see how they're, um, uh, what have they been doing lately? How are they bringing proving times down and, and, and proof sizes especially? They seem to be making um, steady progress. Uh, uh, they're actually, they've announced a uh, test net with 0x, which is very cool. Um, 0x seems to be a very good fit for uh, what they're doing. So see how that looks like. Uh, once the test net is out, um, if it's available, maybe try using it, see what it looks like from a user's perspective. Um, also, snarks and roll-ups look like they'll probably be available sooner. Um, what lessons might be uh, learned from, from that? It's, again, it's very promising, and I think a lot of the, um, the technology there and uh, potential pitfalls and, and advantages maybe uh, snarks could learn from as well. Um, one, th one, one really cool thing is like be more optimistic. Um, you know, we, we kind of feel constrained by scaling uh, challenges, but um, kind of imagine a si situation where scaling is addressed. I don't want to say solved, but um, you know, what if you can do uh, 500 transactions per second? What would your DAP look like? What, what could you do? Um, don't be afraid to dream big when it comes to um, you know, the throughput of your DAP. Um, Starks could also, this is looking down the road a little bit, they could potentially help with some of the uh, uh, sharding challenges, namely the, the, uh, the need to have provable computation and cross-chain uh, sharding. It gets pretty technical, but um, Starks potentially could, could be useful there. Um, that's it. If you guys have any uh, questions. Do we have another mic for her? Um, okay. The question is, uh, why, why not use a different cryptographic protocol like elliptic curve signatures to, to uh, or something similar? Why, why zero knowledge proof? Well, beca because it won't scale. So this is what we do with Ethereum. You use elliptic curve signatures to sign every transaction, and this transaction goes uh, broadcast to all participants of the chain, and every one of them verifies every single transaction. Oh, I see. So you're saying, like, what if we just sign the the root hash uh, of of the side chain, and just have like a bunch of signatures, maybe like threshold signature with uh, validators? Well, in this case, you will have to trust those people who sign the the update. Like somebody signs the update, the the Ethereum contract will check that. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, I I see. Like the majority of the validators signed it, but you still, as if as a as a user. What guarantee it gives to you is that um, the validators agree on consensus, kind of what we have in POA network. Well, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I'm getting the question exactly. So, like, yeah. So, uh, I was just saying that uh, there are various cryptographic protocols, right? That all uh, at the base have the same function of verifying, right? Uh, anything, right? 
Uh, so I was giving an example that if I write an elliptic curve signature uh, in a smart contract, right, uh, it's the same as me writing a zero proof uh, protocol as a smart contract, right? And the smart contract's job is to verify that the side chain is, uh, you know, I don't know, <laughs> the side chain, <laughs> right? Um. You, you, you get. So, um, so what I'm trying to ask you guys is why, why can't I use any other protocol? It's the same thing. Sure, I can answer that easily. Uh, you can use other protocols. There are also other zero knowledge proof protocols like Bulletproofs and Ligero and Hyrex and others. Um, or you can just rely on elliptic curve cryptography in general. Or you can even rely on uh, like uh, Lampert signatures without elliptic curves, which are quantum resistant. The uh, only advantage of Snarks and Stark specifically is the succinctness. So that you, by verifying the proof, you verify much less, like you, you do much less work than the prover did. Like the prover can, can provide a proof for like 1,000 transactions, but for you to verify it costs the same as just verifying one transaction. Whereas with all other protocols, your verification cost is on pair with the prover cost. In, this is why you don't get scaling. Then you have to rely on different scaling techniques, such as sharding or different consensus mechanisms and so on. Mr. Sasha. I have a question around um, the validators. You said they require a lot of compute. Uh, what incentive do they have to do that compute power? Because you need multiple validators for uh, every transaction interface, right? Well, we, not, we don't necessarily need the scan set. We can have just one validator, or just one operator, who is still going to remain trustless because they cannot cheat. Um, but if, uh, but what's the incentive for them? Because it still costs something, right? And if we have multiple operators, what's the incentive for them? And the answer is very simple. We can introduce something like fees. So we, we can introduce a new side chain, and then all transactions on the side chain still cost something. Like there is no free cheese, right? So, but this, the, the cost is going to be much less than current gas costs because it doesn't go to the um, miners. Uh, with limited resource on, on guests which they can sell you. It goes to validators instead. So there be like validator pools that get paid by guests? Uh, there are going to be either validator pools or just a like set of validators who, who produce block in blocks in turn who get paid by, uh, not necessarily by guests, they, they get paid by some fees. Like these fees can be denominated in, in the tokens being transferred, for example, in stable coins. In whatever we're in it, it's it's not limited but essentially yes the users who use the side chain who transact there they have to pay for it because it still costs some it's going to be much less than than the current transactions but it's still going to be some like mm, like fraction of a cent or something you want that uh, add to that like one one fascinating uh, possibility here is uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of unused hardware like namely GPU miners once we switch over to proof of stake whenever that happens um, the, the idea of having uh, incentivized proving, prover nodes is a way to, to use that, that hardware in a, in a way that helps maintain the security of, of dApps, but also um, you know, it's sort of really this excess capacity that will be left over after the transition. And, and in this fashion, you could actually devote these resources to, um, to, to having prover nodes. In, in, in Starkware, or the, the Stark land, can, currently it's really this one organization will what run these prover nodes, and you know, I imagine they'll they'll take a cut, but hypothetically anybody could run these. So, um, in the spirit of making everything as decentralized as possible, um, you know, there is clearly an incentive to to prove these things out, um, and there will be a lot of hardware too. So, I feel like that's an underappreciated aspect of of this technology is is kind of um, finding new ways to to use uh, miners mining hardware for uh, for zero knowledge. Yes. So how, I guess, would this be easily integratable into other blockchain technologies, maybe like that are more uh, consortium-based or private blockchains as well, that are not Ethereum-based? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hypothetically, I'm not aware of, of any reason that couldn't happen. And my first thought would be, 
for a private chain, um, they sort of solve scaling by, uh, by just being more, more centralized and permissioned. So um, by the nature of those uh, blockchains, they already have pretty high throughput. Uh, but maybe there'd be situations where you would want want to um, sort of have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so maybe you could find the right sort of balance there. Um, so I'd like to add that this is a very good question, and indeed, the the great unique opportunity we have with uh, zero knowledge based scaling is that we can add privacy. So we we can add uh, provable privacy, which is accountable, but we can add um, confidential transactions. We can add completely private transactions where um, uh, the participants are not seen. And we can also add private computations, which are scalable. So it, we, we will have eventually user-defined smart contracts in zero, like, you know, based on zero-knowledge techniques, which are verified by other zero-knowledge protocols, which then are aggregated into one block. And um, I see no reason why it, sh we, it cannot be integrated in other uh, blockchains. It just uh, will take some time. It's, it's not as flexible as arbitrary uh, smart contracts on EWASM or with the Ethereum virtual machine. Initially, these contracts will have to be uh, written by hand and will have to be very specific. But eventually, we will progress towards the ar arbitrary computations. So just like a more uh, practical sense, uh, is there anything nowadays on testnet uh, that has like a, or an SDK that allows us to use this nowadays, especially in regards to private transactions? Um, so there is a uh, Plasma Ignis implementation by me and Alex Flosso from Matter Inc. Um, it's on testnet, you can, you can try, you can play around with it. Uh, it's currently a centralized operator proving the transactions. Uh, but we're working on a new uh, release, which is going to be coming soon, where you can actually play around. We're going to provide SDK, API, and it's going to be very compatible with existing toolkits. Um, you will be able to do this. If, if you, if you, uh, private transactions are the next step after that, because we focus on scaling first. It doesn't, private transactions without scaling do not make sense. Like in, in Zcash, we have shielded transactions and transparent transactions. And so few people take use of shielded transactions that they out themselves just by the fact that they use it. If you have like this big black pool, nobody knows what's inside, but you put four bucks in, and then next day four bucks is coming out, it's kind of obvious who did this, right? So you need a lot of, uh, a lot of throughput to be able to hide something in confidentiality. That's why scalability must come first. But if you have any uh, interesting idea on, on scalability, how you want to use it, please come to me after the talk and let's talk about this. You want to add something? Um, in terms of Starks, it's um, it's currently I imagine they have a lot of action on on GitHub. But in terms of the, the kind of the nexus of what's happening, it's really all about um, these test nets that they're they're aiming to build out. So zero X is the first one of these. I, I suspect over the next few months we'll see a lot more different uh, types of test nets. If if you happen to be a developer on Adapt that is kind of looking to solve some of these challenges, it's worth approaching them. Um, from their perspective, they're very eager to to prove this technology out. Um, but I also think over the next uh, few months, we'll see maybe other, other projects uh, kind of embracing what they're doing and kind of their own, putting their own spin on it. And that excites me too. It's just all in the spirit of uh, you know, very open source. I think we had a question back there. Oh, cool. <laughs> yes. So the question is about signature aggregation, whether we can prove uh, BLS signatures uh, in, in the SNARK. And the answer is yes, we can prove anything. We just cannot ma make like arbitrary, um, com like we, 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 do, we do not support tiering complete languages yet for zero knowledge for SNARKs and Starks. They are gonna be possible in the future. But for now, if you define a function, which is gonna be like, let's prove uh, or let's verify this array of BLS signatures, we can totally do this. And it's gonna be cheaper if combined with other tools because Currently on Ethereum, the verification of BLS uh, uh, aggregation will cost you around 200k gas. Uh, verification of a growth 16 zero no, uh, zk snark scheme is 600k uh, uh, gas. So it doesn't really make sense for now unless you just combine it with other with other things. 
But if you compile it, it totally makes sense, yes. And then verification does not cost more. Verification is always constant. It's always like the 600K. Okay, we're running out of time. Thank you, everybody.